Welcome back, everybody, to the OPT Network. Our guest is no stranger to the OPT Network. She is Peg Streep, and we have had many conversations, but Peg has written a new book entitled Daughter Detox, Recovering from an Unloving Mother and Reclaiming Your Life. Now, Peg is a best-selling writer, and she has written or co-authored 12 books. She's a blogger for Psychology Today, and she posts there, and her posts have been read by more than 14 million people on psychcentral.com. She was the unloved daughter and is the loving mother of her adult daughter. She holds degrees in literature from the University of Pennsylvania and Columbia University, and we welcome her back this morning to the OPT Network. Peg, good morning and welcome. Good morning to you too. So Peg, as I mentioned in the opening, you and I have been talking for a while about unloved daughters. And when we first had the very first conversation, I started in my mind, almost judging, if you will, and forgive me for that. And I think many people might, judging that a mother could not actually love or have a maternal instinct toward her daughter. So let's start right there. Mothers that are unable to love their daughters for whatever reason. Well, you know, you're hardly alone in looking away from this particular truth. I mean, our entire culture uh, persists in believing that not only, and these are all important assumptions, not only are all females naturally more nurturing than men, but that all females are nurturing. Two, that motherhood and mothering is instinctual, which it is not in our species. And that all, lo all mothers love their children unconditionally. Um, not one of those assumptions is actually true. And it's not until I actually read Daughter Detox that I could truly, and it's sad, but we are people that need the science behind it. And this book is chalked full of scientific truths that bear this out. Absolutely. Um, you know, in part, uh, I was trained in literature. I don't have degrees in psychology, and I'm not a therapist. So for me, of course, to write something true, I have to rely on uh, research. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that another very important thing is that when you have cultural beliefs, as, our, as we do, and practically all the world does too, by the way, this is not specific to the U.S., uh, these myths about motherhood. The only way really to combat those myths is with scientific fact and theory, real hard evidence. Uh, and the reality of it is that um, science knows a great deal about the importance of the interactions between a primary caretaker, most usually the mother, and an infant in the first three years of life. And the first three years are absolutely crucial, absolutely crucial. And how attentive that mother is, how attuned to her child's needs she is, how responsive she is to that child, how good she is at reading the child's cues and allowing the child the room to express him or herself, uh, to explore. All of that, by the way, are reliable predictors of how well that child will function as an adult. Absolutely. One of the things that you write about in the book is do babies experience stress? And you talked about a famous experiment that is called Steel Face. Let's talk a little bit about that. Oh, this is, in fact, uh, people who are interested should simply Google it because the psychologist who conducted 
these experiments, uh, a man named Edward Tronick uh, actually videotaped the experiments when he did them. Now, mind you, this was in the late 70s. So the idea of a scientist actually using videotape to prove his point right. was, I know this is going to sound funny, but and like in the dark ages, but it made a huge splash. In other words, these, yes, there were words describing what had happened to these babies, um, but there were actual videotapes so you could see it. And basically what he did was he replicated the normal healthy back and forth between a mother and an infant. And he did this not just with very small babies, two, three months old, but also older babies and then toddlers, right? And so at the beginning, you see the baby sitting in, in a, a car seat or a carriage or, or chair. And the mommy is doing the mommy thing. So the baby coos and the mommy coos back and the baby makes a noise, waves her hands, and the mommy responds, right? And that's healthy interaction. And then all of a sudden, the mommy's face goes stone. That's why it's called the still face. Mm -hmm. And she effectively withdraws both in terms of her expression, right? And she goes silent. And what the baby starts doing is she, he, she tries to get mom back on track. Right. So she pulls out her repertoire of cute baby stuff, right? She giggles. She twists. She coos. Nothing happens. And what you see over the course of the minutes that follow is the baby gets more and more and more frantic. Because no matter what she does, the mommy's face remains still. There's still silence. And at the very end, <clears throat> you see the child either basically kind of implode, sink into the seat, right? Mm -hmm. Or even worse, look away, staring into space, protecting herself from the pain of her mother's withdrawal. Um, and that's pretty much... Attachment theory in action. Mm -hmm. um, and the still face experiment shows, and, and of course, this is an experiment, right? right. So the, the child doesn't end up tortured. Sure. The, mommy, the mommy comes back. The kid is reassured. Um, the mommy makes all manner of reparation. She coos at the baby. She strokes the baby. And the breach is repaired. Mm -hmm. But as Tronic says, Imagine that this is an everyday occurrence. Right. Or all the time for this infant. What if the mommy ignores the child more regularly than not? What if the mommy doesn't respond to the baby's cooing most of the time? Mm -hmm. What if the mommy ignores the child's cries and vocalizations? And so that that baby who has a mother who's unreliable in that way or distant or not there, right, will become a child who essentially withdraws, gives up, stares into space because she's learned that no matter what she does, she can't get mom's attention. Mm. That's very damaging. And they did it, you know, they did it with toddlers who had speech. So, um, and there, of course, you see the child using words <laughs> right, to, to get mom back in the game. To get her attention. Yeah. Let me get a break here. Let me get a break here, Peg. But when we come back, we'll talk more about daughter detox, recovering from an unloving mother and reclaiming your life. Stay on point. We're back right after this. Welcome back, everybody, to the OPT Network. Our guest this morning is Peg Streep. She is the author and co-author of 12 books, most of you will remember her from the OPT Network talking about mean mothers. Well, she joins us this morning to talk about her newly released book, Daughter Detox, Recovering from an Unloving Mother and Reclaiming Your Life. Well, once you can get over the hurdle, and I say hurdle lightly, 
that your mother didn't love you for whatever reason, once you can get past that, there's that core conflict um, that is really the tipping point that you sort of write about in the book. Let's talk about that. Yeah, I define the core conflict as, and here's one piece of it, right? Here's one piece of the action. Your growing, growing recognition of the fact that you're wounded and who wounded you, okay? On the other side is your continuing need for your mother's love and your hope that you will get it. Mm-hmm. Now, as long as that push-pull continues, recognition versus that hardwired need for your mother, right? Right. You're going to stay stuck. The tipping point comes when the daughter begins to really care about herself, have self-compassion, recognize that these wounds do need healing and that she can live a better and more fulfilled life and she begins to let go of the other side of, of the equation. She begins to recognize that she will never get her mother's love. Um, it, one reader describes it as the death of hope, and that's true. Mm-hmm. Uh, but on the other hand, it's utterly necessary for the daughter to move forward. Because as long as she keeps thinking in her head, well, if I just if I just rack up one more achievement, right. if I just show her how well I'm doing in life, if I just you know if I just get thinner, if I get sweeter, if I get whatever, right, then she'll love me. Um, that keeps you on the merry-go-round. Mm. The only way of getting off the merry-go-round is to accept the fact that there is nothing that you can do to make her love. Wow, but you can love yourself. And that you can move forward and find, you know, and fill the hole in your heart with all the good things that you've managed to accumulate in your life. So, Peg, I know that you have done this and you know others that have done this. So I want to talk about how you get to that point of acceptance that your mother who birthed you, who was supposed to love you, never will. At what point? Do you come to that realization to start doing the work to get better? And I know it's different for everybody. It, you know, there's, it happens when it happens and not a second sooner. Mm. Um, there's obviously some internal tipping point that, that is reached. It's like water on the boil or something. Uh, sometimes it could happen uh, through somebody else's comments and intervention, uh, your spouse or a friend pointing out that the way your mother treats you is absolutely abysmal. Mm. It could happen because you get married and you have a wonderful mother-in-law or the way that love works in your spouse's or perhaps your friend's family is so different from yours that there's a little button that goes click in your head and you see the toxicity. And then sometimes it's just a moment of readiness that you you feel the need to care for you and that you just can't stay on this merry-go-round, that you owe it to yourself, that you owe it to the people who care for you. Um, it's painful. It's all get out, by the way. There's no, you know, there's no sugar coating this. Right. Uh, on the other hand, there's light at the end of the tunnel. You, I mean, I had one reader um, send me a series of photographs that she entitled "Burden Off My Shoulders," and they were basically her posture changed. Wow. She cut, she cut her mother out of her life. She'd been working on herself and, and on her marriage and her relationship with her children. And um, you could actually see it in the photograph. It was not, really nothing short of, you know, that, that's a metaphor that we all use, taking a burden off your, 
your shoulders, right? Uh, do you think, Peg, or has it been your experience, and I know that you and I have spoken about this, with your own children, when you become a mother, that that feeling of not being connected, not being loved, how do you, and, and there was one lady in the book that said that, you know, she just refused to have children because she didn't want to transfer those feelings, the feelings that she had felt to her child. How do you help women to get past the fact that they may do the same thing that they saw that their, their mother did to them? Recognizing that they're possessed of free will and that good mothering is a thousand different gestures. And as long as you stay on the high road, you'll be fine. I mean, it's about conscious awareness. Nobody is doomed to repeat her parents or her mother's mistakes. No one. And you know, and you know that's a hard. And isn't that a hard sell, though? Isn't that a hard sell, though, Peg? Sorry. Isn't that a hard sell, though? Um. No, I mean, look. I didn't have a child until I was 38. I had decided not to have a child. Right. Because I was afraid of turning into my mother. And then I realized that I wasn't really my mother's daughter anymore. There was nothing to be afraid of. But that, but that said, I approached mothering very, very consciously. Very, very aware of what hurt and what didn't hurt, what was important. And it should be said most of these women, many, many, many of these women become dedicated parents, absolutely dedicated, and they're conscious, and they apologize for their mistakes, and they're good communicators, and they're direct. I mean, you know, they have a huge investment in making sure that the generational pattern stops with the last one. Do you think, Peg, that the recovery is lifelong? For unloved daughters, unloved children? Yeah, I mean, look, again, um, <clears throat> if by recovery and healing you mean good as new as if it never happened, mm -hmm. and you had Linda the Good Witch as your mommy, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, absolutely not. You were not rendered as good as new as someone who had a loving mother. But the hole in your heart gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Mm. And you see it with a different perspective. And you understand it more and more as part of a history which is no longer part of your present. I mean, this doesn't mean that the hole isn't there. You know, I'm 69, almost 70. But the hole is surrounded by so many other things in my life and so many rich things and good things that it's kind of a fact, like being 5'8". <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Wow. And that's, and that's, you know, that's different. And uh, the women who have reclaimed themselves all say variations on the same thing, that yes, it hasn't gone away. It is part of their story. Absolutely. But they own that story, mm -hmm. and it was never about them. Mm. It wasn't about their failure. It wasn't about their inadequacy. It wasn't about them. Wow. Powerful, powerful book. Peg, as always, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and the science and helping us understand. The book once again is called Daughter Detox, Recovering from an Unloving Mother and Reclaiming Your Life. Peg Streep is the author and she's been our guest this morning. Peg, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for having me, bye. Indeed, stay on point everybody. We're back right after this. Welcome back everybody to the OPT Network. Our guest this morning is Peg Streep. She's the author of Mean Mom, and she joins us this morning to talk about her new book, Daughter Detox, Recovering from an Unloving Mother and Reclaiming Your Life. Now, I know that for a lot of people, this concept may seem foreign, Peg, but for others, 
They may say, you know what, I've been struggling with this, as many of the women write in your book, for many, many years. Did you feel it really necessary, obviously you did, and important to put the science and back this book with science so that people could feel more free to feel what they feel? Absolutely. I mean, remember, I had written about this subject before Mm -hmm. in 2009 when Mean Mothers was published, right? Mm -hmm. And the biggest slam on that book, which was correct, by the way, was I sketched the problem, but I didn't give women any solutions. And so, some seven, seven, six, seven years, I kept hearing from women saying, "I love Mean Mothers, but you didn't. You don't tell me how to deal with this. How do you recover? Am I just doomed?" And so, that was really. It was readers who spurred me on to actually get down, do the work, and say, "Okay, how do you recover from this?" Mm-hmm. How do you connect the dots? Because here's the key thing. What the unloved daughter feels most deeply is the lack of maternal love. But the real damage is elsewhere. Mm -hmm. It's in the behaviors she has unconsciously adopted. The assumptions that she makes about relationships about love, about how people act and why they act as they do. And about herself. And about herself, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So that the reality of it is that, that recovery isn't so much as about figuring out why your mother doesn't love you. There's no answer to that. Right. And in the book, you wrote something that I thought was really impactful And it said, and I'm paraphrasing, you first have to know that you are an unloved daughter before you can begin to recover. Absolutely. You have to stop denying it. And you also have to stop asking, why doesn't she love me? I mean, that's that's the irony of it. As long as you keep asking, why doesn't she love me? That makes you hopeful that you can somehow figure out how to change yourself, how to act in a different way, how to be different so that she will love you. Because you think that there's an answer to why. Uh, And the reality of it is, why she doesn't love you is her problem. Hmm. The only problem that you alone can change you to be your best self. And so, but but don't you think, though, for most girls, i.e. women, who have unloving mothers, mothers who are able to not to attach to them for whatever reason, that they do spend the most part of their lives not believing that that could be true? Oh, absolutely. Um, In fact, since I've written the book, I have heard from so many, so many women the age of recognition and the ability to act on it on the, the fact of it, right, appears to be somewhere between forty and fifties. Wow. So even if you recognize young that your mother didn't love you, and I was about four, I think, right? What to do about it doesn't really come into view until you're in your forties. Uh, for many women the recognition really doesn't come until forties to fifties. So most of these women, by the way, are in their, they're, they're real grown-ups. Uh, lots of them have children by the time they recognize this. Um, and often the recognition actually is sparked by having a child and suddenly contrasting your mother's treatment of you with your treatment of your child or children. Wow. But it happens to women who don't have children as well. And again, it, it happens relatively late in life. I mean, 40s to 50s. Is... Yeah, absolutely. And so what you write in the book is that a lot of the, the um, behavior, if you will, that daughters have that are connected to unloved mothers really begin to 
unearth themselves once you come to the realization that you had mother issues. There are a lot of women that will say that they have issue with their mothers, but won't be able to make that leap that their mother didn't love them. But you talk about alcoholism, you talk about promiscuity, you talk about self-harming, all of those behaviors really point back to daughters that weren't loved and nurtured in many cases by their mothers. Yes, they're all maladapt maladaptive coping mechanisms, um, unfortunately. Um, and, and by the way, often women stumble into the recognition pretty much by accident, um, either because they've had a failed relationship and they go into therapy, or a marriage begins to break down, and it is at that moment, they think that they're there really to talk about the relationship or the marriage, and then it becomes more and more apparent that the be their behaviors, actually, have to be traced back to their roots, their childhood roots, mm. for for the for the daughter really really to heal and to change. You you know one one of the things to see of course. I mean you you think you're the way you are because that's how you are. Right. You know? One of the things that was really sad for me as a reader is that some women will never be able to trace it back because unlike you and others of the women in the book and you you mention it you don't find out until their forties or fifties or really sort of mid to late life. A lot of people are not going to do the work in terms of therapy, but you also wrote that in her book, um, Food is Love, Janine Roth talked about, you know, um, physical abuse and emotionally being distant from her father. So she uh, used food as a coping mechanism, but was able to, you know, to trace it back. But a lot of people will not be able to. Absolutely. Well, that was p part of the aim of the book was, in fact, to deliver a self-help book that actually had authority. Mm -hmm. You know, there, um, the book was, in fact, vetted by two psychologists, prominent psychologists, in fact. Um, but more importantly, to, to give people uh, techniques and strategies that um, were based in science. Um, so that, you know, there's a lot of how-to stuff about how to use memory and, and, and what kind of memories to access and how you should access them and so forth. Um, how to shut off the critical tape in your head. Mm -hmm. um, those are all things that uh, unloved daughters struggle with on the daily. Absolutely. Let's get a break here, but when we come back, Peg, I want to talk about how you actually detox, especially during the holiday season and those special times when a daughter just really longs for her mother. Stay on point. We're back right after this. Welcome back, everybody, to the OPT Network. This is the final point on point today. We want to thank our guest once again, Peg Streep, who has really been a regular to the OPT Network for quite some time now. When we first met Peg, I always tell the story because when I first read her articles, I thought there's no real way that a mother could not love her child, most especially her daughter. But over the years, we've had many conversations and I started finally meeting women who were able to own the fact that they didn't feel like they were loved by their mother. Well, she has written a new book and it's entitled Daughter Detox, Recovering from an Unloving Mother and Reclaiming Your Life. And so as I started reading the book, I said to myself, oftentimes it takes science to convince people of what they've known their whole lives for other people to acknowledge that they were unloved by their mother. And on its face, when you say to somebody, my mother didn't love me, you would say, eh, every mother loves their babies. They love them differently, but they love them. Well, research has shown this is not necessarily true. 
the research is bore out in Peg's book and in her own life. And when Peg initially broached this subject, she was criticized badly by so many people that could not believe that she would have the audacity to say such things about her mother. But in truth, she was expressing what she had lived her whole life, and she was trying to heal and cleanse herself. And this book just talks about all sorts of mothers. And I'm going to tell you, when you're talking about your mother, even in a situation where you love your mother, it is hard for many people to be critical about their mother. And I don't think that this is necessarily criticism more than one's truth. And in the book, Peg explores what types of mothers there are. She says there are controlling mothers, there are dismissive mothers, there are unreliable mothers, and there are mothers who just simply, for whatever reason, are unable to love their daughters. And throughout the book, she talks about different scenarios and, and different people recount their experiences and their lives as unloved daughters. And it's heartbreaking because if you're a mom and you love your children, you can't fathom that a mother couldn't. But we're living in a time now, I think, where unloved daughters and unloved children is becoming more and more prevalent. And what she does is she helps these adult women, women in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, and even older than that. She helps them to come to resolve. And I don't necessarily know that resolve is a good word, but she helps you to work through the process in detoxing. And one of the most critical pieces that I thought was important in the book, and if you are a daughter or a child and you feel like you were unloved by your mother, it is something that you absolutely have to pick up and put your eyes on it and let it soak down into you so that you can begin the healing. Well, two critical pieces, actually. First, she says, you have to be able to acknowledge it. You have to be able to see it. And I can imagine that for most people, you don't necessarily want to believe that you weren't loved by your mother. But after you get there and you start doing all of the work that Peg talks about in the book, we've had Dr. Kristen Neff on our show a few times. She is the author and really one of the big researchers on self-compassion. Well, Peg um, really talks about a lot of Dr. Neff's work in the book and how you have to begin with self-compassion. Now, there is a difference in self-aggrandizement and self-compassion, not being puffed up, not being overly confident, but beginning to have compassion and care for yourself and your feelings and what you endured over the life of your childhood and being able to go back and figure what went wrong and understand that it was not your fault. And hopefully being able to forgive your mother and forgive yourself and then start the work. And the work is probably the most daunting part for those women who felt like they weren't loved by their mother because you have to expose it. And when you expose something that has kept you in the dark for so long, you have to expose all of the things around it. She talks about women having eating disorders, women who were cutting, women who have all sorts of emotional problems because they were constantly seeking the love and, and the acceptance of a mother who for whatever reason just wasn't able to do it. And in many of the stories, those mothers are able to own the fact that they didn't and couldn't love their daughters. You know, I was talking to a young woman as I was reading this book, and I said, you know, we just started talking, and I, and I asked her some questions about her family, not ever thinking that she, too, was 
an unloved daughter. She said, my mother never wanted me. And when she said that, it didn't shock me because Peg and I had been talking about this for years and I was now reading her book, Daughter Detox. So I then could have compassion for her. But what I think most people do in a situation like that is we don't want it to be true for that person. And we don't want them to believe that their mother didn't and couldn't love them. And she said to me, quite frankly, my mother told me she never wanted me. So now she, as an adult woman, is having to live with the fact that she has a closeness to her father, but no real relationship with her mother. And she said with a, with a sadness, she said, but it's okay. And so it's really not okay. It's really not okay. And it affects every area of your life, whether you know it or understand it or not. It affects your relationships with men. It, it affects every area of your life. If you don't get to the bottom of your work. And one of the things that Peg says that you need to do is find a picture of that little girl and begin to go back in time. And she walks you through how to treat that little girl, how, to, how that little girl, um, what she was feeling at the time. She walks you through this whole process and she helps you to detox. And I don't necessarily even know if you can really detox, but I know that when you confront a problem and you realize it's a problem, you can start to do the work. And if you've been living with this uncertainty or this knowing your whole life, then it's going to take time and it's going to be a process and everybody's process is different. But I think that those people that support unloved daughters should simply be there to listen with compassion, kindness, and love. Because if you and I were not unloved daughters, we can only just imagine what that must feel like. The things that every girl would hope to share with her mother, and she can't. And so this book is a comprehensive book of information, science, stories, and how to start the healing process. And Peg said to me on many occasions that she was always concerned, and that's why she waited until she was a more mature woman to have her own daughter, because she did not want to repeat the cycle. And the way that cycles are changed is by breaking them, by understanding them, getting to the work, and doing something different. We're out of time for now. We want to thank again Peg Streep, the book Daughter Detox, Recovering from an Unloving Mother and Reclaiming Your Life. You can go to her website. You can also go to her blog site, her Facebook page for more information. This has been the final point on point today. Stay with us, everybody. I'm back to wrap up after this.